So I'm Alec. I uh, used to work at Techlands. I did some concept art in CI Games where I actually fell in love with environmental storytelling. And today we're going to tell you a little bit more about it. I'm Tomasz Andrzejewski. I've been, I am lead artist um, in Techland. I've been lead artist in CI Games. And um, actually I realized today that I've been making games for 10 years now. Um, and let's just, let's just move um, with our presentation. Um, sorry for the delay. Um, we'll start with our um, thesis. So. Okay, so we think that environ environmental storytelling is a language in which games communicate with the player. Uh, it might be kind of weird coming from a writer, but, well, dialogues are kind of like an ornament for a moment. And cutscenes, statistically, we don't really remember them. I don't think any of you could actually recall any cutscene from any game. And what we do uh, remember is atmosphere, is immersion, and everything like that is created through the environment, right? Uh, and environmental uh, storytelling, as, as I said, is a language, so it can be taught. It actually, uh, it has its rules, and it can be kind of decoded by the player. Um, but once we understood how the uh, environmental storytelling works, it can speak volumes, much more than dialogues or cutscenes or anything like that. Um, it's a great way to express yourself. Um, I think we are all creative people. This is why we are here um, at Digital, Digital Dragons. Um, and all creative people, they want to tell some kind of story, a meaningful story. Um, and for us, for artists, um, this, this um, way of expressing this, um, this need for telling a story is actually an environment. Um, with the environment, we create virtual worlds. We give life to scenes that are lifeless. Um, with the environment, we actually embed player um, in the virtual world and we bind everything together for the environments. Uh, but we actually believe that our thesis is much more important than just expressing love and emotion to, for, digital, uh, for, for uh, environmental storytelling. Uh, we believe that every environment you're creating is already telling a story. Uh, and that's pretty much crucial. It's a, it, environmental storytelling has a pivotal role in creating environments and uh, it cannot exist without the environment. Uh, to get the full grasp and importance, we're going to show you how environmental storytelling started. Uh, we're going to start off with different mediums and then we're going to get back to, uh, to games and just kind of like a trip down the memory lane, so to speak. Yeah, so uh, we actually need to go back quite a lot um, to five, fifth, um, eight before, is it okay? Okay, um, to fifth century before Christ, um, Greece. Um, this is actually when this important re relationship between the story and environment actually started happening. This uh, building that you can see, uh, it's, this is called something scanner. Scanner, you probably know the word scene, um, and the word scene comes from the word scanner. And this need to create a context for the stories that were told um, on stages um, made, um, we started, uh, people in uh, Greece, they started creating um, bits of environment to show some kind of context for the story. It might be um, a village or, or a town, but this is where it actually started. But now, um, let me just click, um, but what about our times? So in theaters, it's still very important. Um, stages, um, they are very important for the, for, for the place. Um, and we, I want to show you um, a steal from um, a contemporary play, uh, played by Jana Ross called Request Concert. This is actually a very interesting um, theater play because the stage is actually three-dimensional. Um, the, the, the viewers can see the play from 360 degrees all around the scene. It's pretty interesting because the actress who uh, plays the lead role, well, the only role, Danuta Stenka, she doesn't say even one line in this, um, in this play. The whole play is about her relationship with all the, uh, her, her um, apartment and, and props that are in the apartment. And we need to understand that props in, in co 
in, in contemporary plays, but also in games and in movies, they are actually actors too. They are almost equal to to the actors. And with with uh, this modern expression, um, we've got we need to remember about mise en scène. So all the means to that let us um, convey the story, to emphasize the story, or to tell the story through um, environment. And Again, this is quite important because this is the time when this um, relationship be between narration and, and the environment starts. Um, but what happens... Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. Um, so, now a bit about movies. So, movies are quite interesting because as this, um, as this stage that I showed you before, we, ki we are kind of exploring 3D space. But with 3D movies, we need to explore not only space, but also lighting. Uh, we need to understand everything um, that is going on. So with Blade Runner, everyone probably knows this movie because it's um, one of the most epic movies ever. Um, story is very important, that's, that's very obvious. But also, uh, one of the important parts of this movie is the city. This world is actually a hero too. Um, this, um, epic tale of this vertical noir. Vertical because we kind of know that, that this movie is about um, poor people just living um, at the very bottom of the, of the city and the, the, most, the richest and the wealthiest, they live up, up uh, in the top. And we can see this um, voyage of, of the main hero who goes from the bottoms um, to the very tops of the, of the city. And the main hero, that's quite interesting because main hero is kind of somewhere in the middle, stuck there. As you can see, that's, uh, that's Deckard's apartments. The, you can see that this is still being lit, but this is kind of dark. And he lives actually somewhere in between. Um, so this is, this is quite um, important to, to to note that this environment actually emphasizes this um, story, this story of ascension and humanity. And actually humanity, um, they use, uh, really Scott uses quite a lot of light in this movie. First time we meet Rachel, she is being fully lit. We can see her face being um, lit by the sunlight in the um, Tyrell's apartments, I guess. That's the Tyrell's building. But throughout the movie, we can see that it changes. Um, when we have this investigation scene, when she starts to doubt her own humanity, uh, we can see that the shadow starts to play, and we can see actually this red, um, her, her red eyes. That's a cool um, effect that they achieve there. But towards the end of the movie, when she knows that she is actually not a human. Um, that's how we are seeing um, Rachel um, in this movie. Um, this attention to detail um, is very important also because it really um, amplifies immersion. You can feel that you are a part of this, um, this great journey, this great um, epic story. But what happens if we... Okay. All right. Uh, what happens um, when we strip the narrative? We don't have a story at all. Um, and this is achieved, uh, well, not achieved, but this is something that is happening in paintings and in photography. Um, with this painting, for example, it's a painting by um, Wyspiański called Mulks. Um, in Polish, it's called Chochoły. Uh, it's a painting um, that was done for, for, the, for the play that Wyspiański wrote, um, uh, The Wedding, Wesele. This, there's actually no story in this um, picture itself. There's, th th there isn't any characters, but the, but the mood of this, um, this, this whole um, painting, it actually tells us some kind of story. But the important thing with um, both paintings and photography, and this is photography from Prypeć by um, Vladimir Migutin. Um, we, we, we all tell the stories um, to ourselves, just looking at these pictures. But the thing that we need to remember, whatever we are doing, um, if we are doing games or movies or whatever, we need to remember that we are actually just giving some kind of message. And it's up to the viewer, to the observer, to, um, to, to, to understand this message, to better or worse. And we need to remember about that because um, sometimes we might want to say something and the viewer will get completely different story.
Um, and one um, very uh, quickly about one more movie. Um, it's it's a great movie, Titus Andronicus. It's a, it's about um, it's based on a play by Shakespeare. That uh, originally this place uh, takes place in Elizabethan time, kind of Roman, um, but um, in 1999 it was retold, um, but by Julie Tamor, and it's quite interesting because she's mixing uh, she's mixing. Um, oh, let me click that. Um, she's mixing Roman and Americana, so Roman we kind of understand that, and Americana that's quite um, that's quite interesting that she's using that. It's a kind of like a metaphor um, to to modern day America, but also she she took a text, a play that we well we might know, but um, she didn't change a play, but she wanted to tell a different story. The, the play itself is very grotesque; it's kind of funny, but she wanted to tell a different story, and she wanted to use this story to talk about Holocaust. Uh, something that is very, very hard actually to talk about because usually the the things that are very direct and very um, well they are direct. Um, it's not perceived to be to be the best idea to talk about something as horrific as Holocaust in such a direct manner. So what she did actually with this uh, with this movie, um, most of the of the movie take place. Um, near or inside this building. I don't know if you are familiar, or do you know this building? This building is um, our building in Italy. It was built by Mussolini. It's a very famous um, building in, in, in Italy, and it's, um, it's being remembered as a, as a uh, well, reminiscent of, of these dark days of, of humanity. And making this movie um, take part in this um, environment retells the whole story again, because it's not any more funny, grotesque. It's a grim story about Holocaust. So we need to remember about that, um, that we can tell the same story sometimes, but change the environment changes completely the, the story. Uh, okay, so let's move to games right now. Um, um, how many of you recognize this little thing? Exactly. So basically, Pong, by general, like an abstract gameplay mechanic, is basically two sticks uh, playing with balls, right? <laughs> uh, but adding the dotted line in the, in the middle, it actually starts to tell a story or, of rivalry, or of challenge, of sportsmanship. So basically, just adding the line, it was some kind of environmental storytelling, basically, right? Uh, because after all, it's not necessary for the sake of the gameplay. It's basically it's to suggest that the game takes place in this kind of virtual uh, tennis court. Connect, connected with a name and with a scoreboard and basically you have your story for Pong. And it's all achieved by that. Uh, next one is, uh, can you move that? Yeah. Uh, next one is Tetris. I'm gonna spoil that for you. Uh, at first we really had a problem whether Tetris in general uh, has any kind of environment, environmental storytelling. But after all, we, we thought that, with the help of our other guys, that actually Tetris tells a story as, as a testament of your own failure. And after all, a lot of those um, coin games, basically, uh, were, were some kind of testament of failure because the sheer persistence of the player, of the gamer, was the only thing dividing it, right? Uh, however, what was really the most important thing about Tetris is that since it was uh, designed by a Russian guy and he never got an ownership of the idea, Tetris was, was multiplied, copied, and sold in different variations, right? And we realized that actually you can use uh, environmental storytelling as a marketing tool. Yeah, a lot of different, different stuff. Let's move to the arcades. Yeah, and in, 80, in the 80s, we were given arcades. Um, we probably all spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of time playing um, Punisher. Um, so with this kind of games, there the, the weren't really a lot of story. Um, it was usually like a couple of lines of text, and that was it. Um, so the, actually, the story was told through the environment. When we were progressing in the game, we could ch see the level. They would change. They would build up to something, um, probably some big boss um, fight. And it was a great visual uh, journey. So um, we are not exactly telling the story here. Only the environments um, are telling this um, story. Okay, sorry. 
Um, so every single time, it's, it's basically kind of the same gameplay. It's, it's ki uh, quite similar to Tetris. It's actually quite similar to Flippers as well. Sometimes when we're going to play Flippers, we don't pick the gameplay because uh, they are basically the same. We just pick the one that we want to play, like um, Adam's Family or whatever. And with the, this kind of games, it was kind of very similar because the gameplay is usually very similar, but we were picking, I would pick Punisher over um, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs just because I liked Punisher and this kind of setting more. And I love Dinosaurs. So I love the yeah, um, but the thing that started here that is also worth mentioning is that actually um, this kind of games, they put player in the center um, of the environment. And it was one of the first times when there was um, a relationship between the player and the environment with all these um, barrels that you could destroy, things that you could pick up from the environment. Um, and it's the beginning of this kind of relationship. Uh, we're going to just jump forwards a little bit uh, into FPSs, because FPSs were really important, especially for uh, environmental storytelling, because the perspective shifted. The whole universe is suddenly in your eyes, right? Uh, so it was much more immersive. Uh, the container became much more kind of perceptive and everything. And we really wanted still to tell great solar stories within an action-packed, dynamic environment, right? Uh, but a cornerstone, in our opinion, uh, in case of environmental storytelling, was actually uh, 3D Realms and their uh, Duke Nukem. First and foremost, uh, trying to design a game is usually uh, thinking about what kind of fantasy are you trying to convey, are you trying to sell to the player. Uh, Duke Nukem was specifically made for adults, and it was kind of like the first uh, archetype of this kind of 80s fantasy bare-chested uh, character, Duke Nukem, obviously. And truth be told, the first time I visited this visual, uh, virtual uh, Los Angeles, I actually felt that uh, the world was crumbling just in front of my eyes, right? And you actually could become a part of this destruction. And it's really important because it empowered Duke himself, and it, it empowered players. Right? So destructive environment was a new connection between the player and the game itself. And it gave you a real good feeling who we are, where we are, and what we are doing, and why we are so powerful. Right? Uh, obviously, newest game follow. Uh, in Battlefield, you can actually, it is a testament of your destruction, testament of your own experience. And it's really important to actually convey that, this kind of interactivity with the player himself. Uh, Next. Uh, yeah. Um, go okay. On. So after <laughs> all, the, uh, the lesson here is that giving players the ability to destroy things, it gives him control over the environment. But what happens when the environment holds control over you? Yeah, and this, uh, this is the case of the game um, Inside. Um, let me just click. Um, in this game, you, you might have played this game. Um, it's very interesting because in this game, the environment actually controls your actions. Um, all your actions are based on what the environment is t telling you. It might be um, uh, avoiding light, because if you will go into the light, um, you, will be, you will be killed. But also the environment um, shows you directions of um, where to go, where to look. Um, shows you POIs, um, things that sh should, you should interact with. Um, and it, well, you are not owner of this environment as a player. The environment itself is actually controlling your um, actions. Uh, let's move to immersive simulators. I, I think a cornerstone, another cornerstone in environmental storytelling. Uh, let's start with Thief. Again, um, I can't emphasize much how much selling a certain fantasy to the player is important for uh, creative people as, as we. And the best thing about uh, Thief was that for the first time, you were in kind of like a dialogue with the environment. It was selling a fantasy of a spy, of a thief, of an, of an assassin. And what's the best way to do it? But then allowing playing to eavesdrop on other people. And by expanding his knowledge of the world, he was expanding his gameplay possibilities and options, uh, which is really important. Um, Environmental storytelling and player expression, especially in Thief, was, uh, was kind of crucial and, and, as I mentioned, a cornerstone uh, because it allowed players to, by gaining knowledge of the world, finding new, multiple solutions of, um, to certain problems. And what is really the most important thing here is that since the narration in Thief is nonlinear because you can pace uh, your own way of gaining this information, it allowed players to play as 
he actually wanted. So give him a lot of freedom. Uh, let's move to another immersive simulation, System Shock 2. Uh, System Shock 2 is, is my, one of my favorite games, to be honest. And uh, while I was doing a little bit of research about that game, I've noticed that actually inventory system itself is a perfect incentive for exploration. Because you need all of those tools, and you need to find them. And that actually incentivizes exploration, exploration that itself. Uh, progression cho choices mattered. So as you were picking your abilities, uh, your tools, and everything like that, uh, those choices mattered because you could open or um, actually got stuck in different rooms. And that was really fun because uh, you really wanted to get back there once you got uh, all of your tools and abilities. And that incentivized uh, repetition. And repetition, especially in environments, uh, inv environmental storytelling, is kind of like connecting the dots. So you're feeding the player certain informations, and suddenly they're all imprinted in his head. And as the message is repeated, it kind of anchors the player in this world. And what was really imp I I important in System Shift 2 especially was that the creators designed Van Brown, the, the spaceship, with uh, certain rooms that were kind of, we, we knew what they were for. We knew that those were the spaces where people were, uh, were eating, were sleeping, etc., etc., etc. And this familiarity, even though Von Braun is something out of science fiction, anchored the player himself. Uh, of course, Bioshock. I think a lot of has been told about Bioshock. And I think the greatest thing about Bioshock is uh, a certain balance of push narr narrative and pull nar uh, narrative. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. Um, but the, the, the thing about Bioshock and, all, uh, and System Shock 2 as well was that it was kind of walking on the ruins of a destroyed world and you were asking yourself what happened here and you felt like this inquisitive detective trying to connect the dots of what happened here, right? Uh, but while talking about Bioshock, we have to talk about, and it's really funny, uh, that was spoiling the, the third one, uh, we have to talk about push and pull nar narrative. So basically, pull narrative is the environment, is something that is incentivizes you to go there, to reach there, etc., etc. And the push environment, that is basically uh, the narrative. So all of your cutscenes, all of your dialogues, etc., etc., etc. So striking a perfect balance between those two techniques is really important, not only for us, but for all of you people as well. Uh, yeah, let's move to in different worlds. Yeah, um, with Dark Souls, um, I like to talk a bit about, um, um, about the world that you actually um, experience and you try to find out what happened there. With Dark Souls, um, we've got very similar situation, but um, we are not being told directly um, what happened. We actually need to find out everything. And it's, um, we, we're calling this in different world because that's part of, we, we, we can try to create environments like that as well. The, the, this world of Dark Souls, it doesn't carry the players in this, uh, in this environment, in, in this world. Um, the world is indifferent of his actions. It's just there. You can just, you can try and explore these um, uh, vicious um, places, um, but they, they are not waiting for you. There's just nothing for you. Um, actually, but we got environments to that are uh, living worlds, and with let's just click uh, with Witcher Three, um, we could see this living world and the world in which all your actions actually have consequences. So it might have been the stakes burning because you did something. Um, it's a whole mention of uh, Bl Bloody Baron. I think that's his name. Um, and these kind of consequences, they actually embed player more in the environment. And when you can see that the environment changes because of your actions, and sometimes these kind of consequences are not, uh, not very obvious. Sometimes you might not even know what will happen and what will trigger what. It's very interesting. As a, it's a good tool to use as a designer. So let's sum it all up with the history. So basically, uh, it's a lot. It's quite a lot. Uh, environmental storytelling, after all, provides uh, a context for players' actions, act as a marketing tool, as with Tetris, uh, evokes a sense of progression, it's a visual journey, uh, players' input, so 
as, as with destruction of environments and everything, it leaves this visible uh, player's uh, fingerprint, which is really interesting and important. Uh, it's realization of player's fantasy, which I think is most, most crucial point on this list. Uh, and it's nonlinear, no sequential, so player has seamless experience of knowing the world. What I do, do I have the other part? Uh, yeah, well, uh, we, we talked um, about um, uh, this kind of things about foreshadowing. We'll be talking um, a bit later, a um, bit more. Um, what's very important is that we are treating environmental storytelling as a tool. Um, these are some of the things that you can use it, uh, how you can use it. Um, but yeah, let's just move forward. I mean, we just we talked about it. We don't have much time. Yeah, it's so. basically for you guys if you want to uh, download later on the uh, the presentation and check it by yourself. Uh, okay, so I'm sure that a lot of you guys know this image. So it's basically kind of like a puzzle uh, where, where we are asking whether it's murder or suicide. And our theory, our, our thesis is that actually the, the answer itself is not really important. Uh, what is important is the interpretation. Because interpretation means that someone who's trying to figure out what's going on here is engaged. Is much like with, uh, with photos and with, uh, with paintings and stuff like that. Uh, and we believe that part of successful uh, environmental storytelling is actually the art of asking the right questions. Allowing players to fill in the gaps with their own imagination in with their own minds, right? Uh, so once the player is invested with, uh, with um, interpretation and everything, he participates in the story and the world. So he tries to understand it. He tries to understand the rules, as I mentioned before, about the language and everything like that. Uh, it's by building logical and reasonable causality, a player realizes that the world he's participating in is actually pretty much there. It's this kind of, um, I would say, illusion of truth in case of the world you're trying to create. It builds connection. And because player interprets this in himself, he attaches his own meaning to it. Which is really awesome because the relevance is not forced onto him. And he can figure out his own uh, theory about stuff that's going on. Um, he's a director of his own emotions, and uh, because we all are touched by absolutely different things, and I believe this is the most important thing about environmental storytelling. Um, yeah. yeah. The important thing is that we all want players to be engaged and to feel smart when they discover things. We don't want to give them always the answers and be just very straight in your face with, with the things that we are telling them. Yeah, and this is our definition. This is something that we actually strongly uh, will, will believe that this is... Um, envir environmental storytelling in games is a process of defining an environment in which player exists through interaction and interpretation. Um, as this is a tool, as we already have mentioned, yes. uh, we realized that actually environmental storytelling can be realized on at least three different levels. Um, yeah, let's just... We'll move forward. So the high level, we divide it into three levels, high, medium, and low level. Um, just naming, it's uh, easier for us. Um, on the highest level, it's the fantasy that you are trying to give to players. It's your set of rules. Um, okay. All right, it might be um, a virus struck New York City. Um, it might be a grim future when there is only war. Um, or it might be a city in a, among the clouds um, being ruled by a prophet. It's the set of rules that you're going to create that all will actually follow. Um, gameplay should follow this kind of um, fantasy. Uh, well, basically everything that um, goes after this first initial thought and idea. Actually, a clear fantasy helps you guys to sell your games because it acts as a marketing tool as well. Because basically when you think of, uh, I don't know, Bloodborne versus Dark Souls, they're kind of like the same. I know they're, the gameplay is different, but they're trying to sell absolutely different fantasy. And the greatest distinction is basically between uh, the high concept. And on the medium level, this is your um, unique selling point. This is the story that you are um, telling. This is something that, you, that you're going to use to hook up the player's um, attention. It might be um, a U-bot in, in, in the middle of the jungle um, in Uncharted 2, I think. Or um, it can be a mental institution um, in Dishonored 2. 
or it can be an uh, accidental zoo in the middle of, of the, the city. That's this kind of um, ideas that will be interesting for the players and unique. Through that, you can tell a lot of interesting stories. And on the lowest level, this is, this, um, this is what we probably, when we say environmental storytelling, this is what we understand by, uh, by this... Um, uh, by it. Uh, it might be like a room, for example, or someone who died in a bathtub um, using some kind of toaster from Fallout 3, or it's a murder scene that you need to um, investigate. That was, um, I can't remember, what was that? Oh, I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, or, or, and, uh, for example, Witcher 3, the seven cuts in. Um, where there's actually seven cuts if you'll um, count them. So this is kind of small stories that are self-contained, um, and this is this um, very well basic understanding of environmental storytelling. The small um, stories that are contained within. Okay, so let's strip it down uh, from my perspective and from Tomasz Tom Tom perspective. Uh, why do we use environmental storytelling, and we want to use it, and why we want you guys to uh, take more care about it? So basically, from my point of view. From writer's point of view, environmental storytelling absolutely solidifies the theme. It reminds of the main storyline. Uh, however, with micro stories, you can go in which direction you want. So it's kind of a huge container for narrative purposes. Uh, it's a beautiful backstory setup. Uh, it's creating easily understandable characters as well because the placement of your characters, his surroundings tells a lot about the character itself. So you don't have to put a lot of stuff into dialogues after that, to be honest. Uh, exploration of supporting themes. As I mentioned, those micro storytelling uh, events can happen everywhere, everywhere in the world and that's pretty awesome. And creating stories that resonate with more peers. As I mentioned before, as players interpret the story, it's much more powerful. Yeah, and from environment um, artist's point of view, um, first of all, it creates wireframe, this very core of, of, the, of the creation and the boundaries for this um, creation. Um, it, if done right, it increases uh, believability both of the story and the environment um, you will be making. Um, the thing that I like the most about environmental storytelling is working with the ideas that actually shouldn't work together. Uh, we me I mentioned this um, Ubot in, in a jungle. Um, I've been playing Tomb Raider um, recently. There's a um, sheep stuck in a glacier. And this kind of ideas that when you first look think about them, they shouldn't work. If you will make them work, you will create something unique, something new, and it can be your creative um, outlet. And also, um, for us, it's a great um, tool to echo the story. So when you know the story, you can um, put bits of it in the, in the environment. Uh, we, uh, we started thinking about um, gameplay um, as well, how you can use environmental storytelling in gameplay, and you can um, use it as a tutorial um, to um, teach um, players something, um, to telegraph, we might be talking a bit um, uh, later on, um, use it to, to, for the pacing, navigation, and it's very often used as a streaming and optimization tool, so you need to remember about that because it, um, binds together environmental storytelling and code. Uh, in case of how we work on uh, environmental storytelling, we'll, what we think is the best uh, kind of guideline to, to do it. So uh, first of all, as I mentioned, what kind of fantasy are you trying to sell, to, sell, to convey, to show? Uh, then remember, gameplay always goes first. We, need, we can't stress this enough. Um, gameplay always goes first. Um, it's the most important thing. Without the gameplay, well, basically, you don't have a game. It can be the, the most beautiful, the best written game. If there's no gameplay, you don't have a game. Uh, then you brainstorm the theme. Uh, you collect photos. You collect those tiny bits of uh, knowledge and everything. Uh, you research the hell out of it. And then you create a mood board. A mood board that is easily understandable by all, all of those people who's working with you. And this is something that you notice that, okay, it kind of works or it doesn't work, and that's the moment you say yes or no. Then you white box it. Yeah, you need to white box and you need to mock up everything that you need. And actually, uh, with, the, with the production phase, 
this is where you should be spending most of your time and efforts on white boxing and mocking up and testing and redoing, remaking. But this phase of white boxing, testing, changing, repeating, that's the most important part. And we're going to finish off with uh, really quick tips and tricks for all of you guys, yeah, uh, just to so remember. Just white boxing. Again, um, we talked about this. This is from um, Uncharted. Really, spend most of your time here because it will save money and time later on. Uh, then we have pacing, which is really important because, uh, well, it kind of tells you what kind of tempo, what, what the player perception is. Uh, as you ever played Shadow Warrior 2, it's a hell of a speedy game. You're just running around, jumping around, and there's no place in there for micro storytelling from the sheer uh, cause that player is just running all the time. And so you have to design all of your environmental storytelling for players' speed. So you have a fast game, you have a slow game, you can do a lot of stuff with that. So a couple of games, for instance, slow down, slow down players in the hubs. So it's easier for the player to look around. Um, for sure, oh, it disappeared, sorry. Um, so um, let me just try, maybe we can see that. Um, Okay, there's something wrong with the presentation. Okay, so um, in Batman, um, Arkham City, um, when you play as a Catwoman, there's a part when you need to break into a safe, and the safe is hidden behind the, uh, behind the painting that you were briefly seeing. Um, the, it's a painting um, called um, Kain and Abel, and you can see a character um, holding other character in the arms. And this is actually foreshadowing what will happen in the story. The whole game builds to this epic moment when Joker actually, oh, I don't want to spoil this for you, so. Um, something happens to Joker and Batman carries him out. And this is uh, this kind of interesting um, build up to this epic um, story moment uh, built through the uh, three games, actually. It's actually not easy to talk about foreshadowing without spoiling anything. Yeah. Uh, telegraphing, that space, right? So uh, there's a lot of, in case of telegraphing stuff, uh, gameplay-wise especially, you can actually, through environmental storytelling, uh, tell uh, explain mechanics to the player. For instance, if you have electrified fence that is like uh, a skeleton next to it, player can understand what's going on, and he probably won't do anything bad with that uh, with a fence. And this beautiful cut of the limbs, I, I believe, one of the most memorable quotes as well in games. You can use uh, environmental um, environment. Um for navigation, it's a very um, good gameplay tool. Uncharted does it very well. Um, it's not very, it's 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 not something that stands out from the environment. It's part of the environment. It goes well with the story. Um, so if done nicely, um, it's a very good tool. Um, so juxtaposing, um, I said before about having this um, contradictory ideas work together. And sometimes when you've got this kind of ideas, um, they actually, because of the contrast, they are being emphasized. Like in Dead Space, um, like it's a couple of balloons. It's a, it's a very um, easy to, um, to make prop and some flowers, but they achieve this very eerie feeling of this very bloody scene and something that we actually think about that is happy and, and, and nice. Uh, next one is sen sensibility. Uh, be mindful and research because you can put a lot of stuff that can offend uh, a lot of different people, right? So you have to be really mindful about it because this, uh, your whole map can be actually taken out of this. Is of a, this is a part of the frame from one of the multiplayer maps from Call of Duty 4. It had to be pulled out, um, this map, because this, this frame, it actually says God is great. And it had to be pulled out, the whole map. It was given back um, during, well, with one of the DLCs. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to attach meaning to uh, your environmental storytelling scenes. So absolutely be mindful of uh, pop culture as well. Yeah, put a lot of Easter eggs and everything, just have fun. Walk with references, that's quite, um, that's quite important and kind of obvious, but really walk with references because a lot of times I can see people that uh, they are not using references and they are coming up with stuff. Um, we, we want to imitate life as closely as possible, so let's use references as often as we can. And a bit um, 
one of my favorite games, actually, um, and this is why I wanted to have this slide, um, because um, I play quite a lot of um, Destiny, and I love this game, but they had a great environment. So today we had the talk um, about the levels they created, and they are wonderful. It's like the, the most, uh, the best levels that I probably have seen, one of the best ones, but there were no story behind it. It was empty shell. Um, I was interested and I was so in uh, in this in environments, but there was just nothing behind it. And it's a broken promise, so don't do that. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna have the, we don't have much time left, I yeah. believe. So uh, we're gonna skip the personal space bits. It's basically psychology, so who cares? Mm. Uh, and yeah, uh, ain't nobody got time for that. Uh, we don't think so. False, absolutely. Uh, because as I mentioned before, environmental storytelling is absolutely everywhere and you have to use it as a tool and you have to understand it. And yeah, all that's games, it. All Cheers. games have it. Yeah. So, oh. okay. Uh, the statement is false, but we have still some uh, time for questions, so it's true. So, um, if anybody would like to ask a question, please come here. Uh, hi, great presentation. You showed a lot of examples, and uh, I wonder if uh, there is a boundary that you can't really push with environment storytelling uh, in case of uh, a lot of plots interchanging with uh, each other. So if you have a story with a lot of plots that are somehow connected and you want to convey them with uh, storytelling uh, from the environment without dialogues, uh, is there any, any advice on that? Or you had uh, some kind of wall that you couldn't uh, push through uh, in case of that? Um, yeah, well, uh, uh about environment, I don't think there are any boundaries. Uh, I, I, I don't think there should be. Um, it depends on the plot and the story and how, how it actually, and what's the most important thing for you. So, so first, when you think about whatever you are doing, you need to think if, if the art and environment is going to be important or the story, because maybe, for example, if the environment will be too rich, um, it will hide the story. And if you will have this interchangeable, I mean, yeah, story arcs, um, but I don't think there are any, any boundaries. I, I, I wouldn't like them the, to be any boundaries. I believe your question basically is the matter of focus, how you uh, cut down your nar narrative bits basically and how you're gonna express them in the world. Yeah. So maybe you want to try uh, to design some kind of emotional timetable uh, for your character and your character arcs and you want to uh, solidify them by creating certain environments, right? So I believe that's the way to go, to actually pulling down it to bits and trying to figure out where, where they're connected and, and how can they be expressed through the environment itself. So focus. Yeah, we talked about pacing, for example. So pacing might be a tool to use um, if you want to show some, highlight some story points, for example. And for the environment, you can use pacing, for example. Yeah, okay, thank you. Hi, um, I know that this uh, talk was mostly uh, on, uh, focused on the visual side, but I'm, my question is, uh, do you and how do you imagine how these environments sound like and what the sound might uh, tell the story of this environment, what happened there? I absolutely believe it is a part of environmental sort of thing. We haven't told about it because we are not sound designers. And we really yeah, didn't do want you, to. Do you imagine how it might sound? Absolutely. Usually, I mean, uh, with the themes of character themes and everything, I remember watching lately uh, how they did uh, Kratos feel, uh, theme for God of War 4, and when it appears, how it appears, and everything like that. It's, it's really important. I believe it is a part, like in movies, uh, you can juxtapose things with, um, like, there's a blood buff, basically, and there's something going out from the radio, like a happy song or something like that. Uh, you can actually attach a lot of those things we actually told about today to sound design as well. 
Um, so the one thing, uh, but it's general um, thing, when you are um, working on something, you're not in a bubble. You need to work with other departments. So whatever you are doing, you need to think about a lot of stuff. You, even if you are doing only environment, you need to think about the sound and, and to have, just to have it in your mind that there needs to be a sound. Um, so yeah, you just need to work together, basically. Thanks. Anybody else? Maybe one last question. If not, then oh yeah, we have. Oh, um, I I don't know actually. Um, um well, uh, we'll be we'll online. figure it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll. Okay, so if if that's all, and thank you very much once again, Thomas and Alec. Thank you very much, guys.